Okay, I'm ready for my next trip, but as you can see, I don't have any luggage and I don't need my passport. And the reason is that I'm already at my destination, that is Rome. And that's because I'm going to visit Rome through the eyes of a friend of mine from Croatia who came here for the first time. Tvrtko! That's his name. Hello. It's not a weird sound. Tvrtko. Yes, that's my name. Yeah. Tvrtko. Tvrtko. So what are your expectations about Rome? Uh, well, I'm expecting good food. Yeah, first of all. And that's the most important thing exactly. for, for Tvrtko. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. And, and uh, Colosseum. And the Colosseum. <laughs> that's and all, then everything. all the rest can just, you know, yes, you can everything. forget about it. Exactly. Well, okay. we'll see it. I don't know what's there in Rome, like, but like we can see. Yeah, you will see. There, there's a lot of stuff to see. But yes. so let's go. We are leaving my apartment, and since we are in a suburban area, and there's not much to see here, except for the neighbors' yards and their barking dogs, we'll have to go downtown for the most important sites in Rome. We'll have to take a bus which, unexpectedly, arrived just after a few minutes. This bus will take us to the closest subway station, Battistini, which is the last stop on Line A, one of the two only lines of Rome's subway system. We are riding the subway uh, towards Flaminio, the stop where we'll uh, get off. And we are on line A of the metro system of Rome, which is not very efficient because we only have two lines, line A and line B, and they only intersect in one point, in the center where the central station is. So it's really not convenient when you have to go somewhere in Rome because even if you're close to your destination, you still have to go all the way to the center, then change lines and then go to your final destination, which is kind of stupid, but that's the way it is. And so, you know, like this is a big problem of Rome, transportation, how to get to places. It's really complicated for some people, especially when it's crowded and, you know, uh, that's a problem. But it only takes us a few minutes to get to our destination, which is only a few stops away on the same line. All right, we're in Piazza del Popolo, Popolo Square, which uh, many people think means square of the people, because Popolo in, in Italian means people. But it actually comes from Latin. It's a Latin word, populus, which was a tree, uh, which is popular in English and maybe, I'm not sure about this, we will have, we'll have to check, but probably it was named uh, after this tree because this square is where the, the kind of tree uh, used to grow. I will check that. And actually the legend says that there was a grove of poplars not far from here by Emperor Nero's tomb. The center of the square is marked by one of the 13 ancient obelisks of Rome this one is called Flaminio Obelisk, built during the kingdoms of the pharaohs Seti I and Ramses II in the ancient Egyptian town of Heliopolis, and then brought here by Emperor Augustus. In 1823, the Italian architect Giuseppe Valadier built a fountain at its base with four stone lions to imitate the Egyptian style. On both sides of Porta del Popolo, the ancient gate that was the starting point of the Flaminia Road, we have the Church of Santa Maria del Popolo and the Carabinieri Station that is one of the stations of an Italian military force charged with police duties. Right behind the church, a hill named Pincio gives access to Villa Borghese, one of the biggest parks of Rome, and from up here not only can you see the entire square, but you can also spot the Dome of St. Peter's Basilica and other important buildings of Rome. We go back down, and while someone is riding a bike with his beautiful cat, 
comfortably sitting on his back, we walk between the so-called twin churches that mark the starting point of the renowned Via del Corso. Via del Corso? Yeah, we are in Via del Corso, which is the, you know, like the shopping street of Rome. Okay. With lots of stores and the labels and stuff. But like probably expensive ones, like Prada or like H&M and uh, and We also have like cheaper stores. Okay. Then yeah. we can buy stuff. Yeah. yeah. Actually, lots of the stores here offer significant discounts on their products from 20 to even 70% off. And while the stores in Via del Corso are still affordable for pretty much everyone, one of its side streets, Via dei Condotti, is only meant for those who have a fat wallet. Just take a look at the signs. Michael Kors, Dolce Gabbana, Salvatore Ferragamo, where a t-shirt costs 230 euros. And then we have Jimmy Choo, for Sex and the City enthusiasts, Giorgio Armani, Bulgari, and of course Prada and Gucci. We just got to Piazza di Spagna, which owes its name to the Embassy of Spain, and which is mainly famous for two things, its fountain and the Spanish steps. The so-called Fontana della Barcaccia, which translates to Fountain of the Ugly Boat, was sculpted between 1623 and 1629 by Pietro Bernini and his son Gian Lorenzo. Just like pretty much all public fountains in Rome, you can drink its water, which is a great relief when during the summer temperatures reach 40 Celsius degrees. The Spanish steps, or Scalinata di Trinità dei Monti in Italian, are a set of steps that allows you to reach the top of the hill dominated by the Trinità dei Monti church. These steps have often been used for fashion shows, with models walking down the stairs, and became famous in the US thanks to the movie Roman Holiday with Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck. On top of the Trinità dei Monti hill, you can have a nice view of the square, and you can even have something to drink and enjoy the sunny weather on one of the rooftop cafes of the area, such as Il Palazzetto, which is also a hotel, restaurant and wine bar overlooking the Spanish steps. And while a dog is happily playing with his leash, we keep on walking, and from Piazza di Spagna we go back to Via del Corso, where, in Piazza Colonna, we find Palazzo Chigi, the official residence of the Prime Minister of the Italian Republic. The square takes its name from the marble column of Marcus Aurelius, which has stood here since the year 193 AD, and its relief commemorates Marcus Aurelius's Danubian and Marcomannic Wars. After walking all the way to the end of Via del Corso, we end up in the majestic Piazza Venezia, where you can't miss the imposing monument to Vittorio Emanuele II, first king of a unified Italy, which is also the reason why it is called Il Vittoriano. But this monument is also known as l'Altare della Patria, the altar of the fatherland, because it holds the tomb of the unknown soldier with an eternal flame built under the statue of Goddess Roma. And while a tourist is trying to find some relief from the heat in one of the fountains of this monument, we keep going up so that we can have a better view of the square. But moving along the perimeter of the Vittoriano, you can see so much more, like the Teatro di Marcello, an ancient open-air theatre dating back to the closing years of the Roman Republic, Trajan's Market, probably the world's oldest shopping mall with shops and administrative offices, the Roman Forum that we'll visit tomorrow, and of course, the Colosseum. Now we're looking at the Colosseum, which is amazing from far, and I'm sure it's going to be even more amazing. From up close, but yes. it's the first time yes, ever I, you see yes, the Colosseum in person. Well, Ro uh, Roman one. Well, uh, well in yeah. Rome, because I, yeah. we have it in Croatia. theaters and stuff you've, you have oh, yeah, seen, but, it's not but the, the same. Yeah, but right. the real, the, but the only real deal Colosseum, is here. this is it's the very first time you see it. Exactly. And it's really beautiful. And, and your first impression, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, it looks, I, I don't know, it's just like amazing. It's like very ancient, as I said. <laughs> Everything is very ancient here and it's really cool. Our next stop is the Campidoglio, the Capitoline Hill, one of the seven hills on which Rome was built, with the statues of the twin brothers Castor and Pollux, the so-called Dioscuri an equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, and the Palazzo Senatorio, the Senatorial Palace. We are at the City Hall of Rome, uh, 
il Campidoglio, that's how we call it in Italian, and this is where the mayor of Rome is, and uh, you can see here the symbol of Rome. Yes, because right around the corner, a small statue on top of a column portrays the mythical she-wolf that nurtured the twins Romulus and Remus. Romulus was destined to become the founder and first king of Rome. Before leaving the Capitoline Hill, we fill up our bottles of water at one of the many public drinking fountains of the city. This one, as the inscription states, received its water from the Aqua Marcia, the third and one of the longest aqueducts that supplied the city of ancient Rome. Since there's an exhibition about the Colombian artist Fernando Botero here these days, we come across one of his sculptures, Horse with Bridle, that he created in 1999. Yes, because the Vittoriano also hosts several museums with different exhibitions all year round. It's time for lunch, and we're going to have a meal with typical Roman dishes in one of the most renowned restaurants in downtown Rome, l'antica Birreria Peroni. Did you find the place inside? No, we have to ask here. Let's hurry because I'm hungry. Yeah, let's go. At the beginning of the 20th century, this place was a storage area for beer and ice that were delivered in the neighborhood on horse-drawn carriages, hence the name Antica Birreria, which means ancient brewery. This is the moment you were so anxiously yes, waiting for, for food. the moment we would eat in yes. Rome, and we are going to order what? Uh, frito misto. Yeah. And you're going to have mozzarella di bufala. Yeah. And then we're gonna have carbonara. Yeah. Both of us. And or I'm two, maybe two, two carbonara. Yeah. Or maybe I'm thinking like on a trichana to try. Like maybe to, I'm not sure. Because yeah. then we can. Yeah, yeah. You can try some of my carbonara and I can try some of your uh, Yeah. Sounds but I'm kind of like feeling something for this like creamy stuff. So like carbonara sounds really good. Okay, so then take carbonara. It's okay. We can try we can a matriciana some other place. Okay. And just after a few minutes, here comes our carbonara, whose original recipe includes eggs, jowl bacon, pecorino cheese, oil, salt, and pepper. So how was lunch? It was super yummy. Yeah. I ate too much, that's the problem. Yeah, but I'm it's still not excited. over yet. We are gonna yes, have ice, ice cream. cream. Yeah. I'm excited about that, but carbonara is definitely a good choice. Yeah. Even though I'm, I, I want to try am, amatriciana. Amatriciana? Exactly. Yeah. Well, and this we'll try cheese it. and spec was good. No, yeah, yeah, the scamorza, yeah, yes, scamorza cheese with, yeah, that smoked cheese with the spec. With that. So you liked it? Yes, very much. La Antica Bireria Peroni. Yeah. Definitely to go. Yeah, okay. And now we're going to? Trevi Fountain. Yeah, Trevi Fountain. Trevi Fountain and Pantheon. Let's go. Let's go. Yes, our next stop is the Trevi Fountain, and I'm curious to see Tvrtko's reaction when he sees it for the first time. Can you imagine working here? Yeah. This fountain, designed by the architect Nicola Salvi, is the largest Baroque fountain in Rome and one of the most famous in the world since it has appeared in several movies, including Fellini's La Dolce Vita. A very common tradition here is to throw a coin in the fountain using the right hand over the left shoulder, and by doing so, you'll be granted your wish to come back here in the future. It looks like about 3,000 euros are thrown in the fountain every day. In the meantime, Giuseppe, a friend of Tvertko's, has joined us, and we are all headed to the Pantheon. To get there, we walk through Piazza di Pietra, Square of Stone, where we can still find today the Temple of Hadrian, built by his adoptive son, Antoninus Pius, in the year 145. And we're finally here, outside the Pantheon. This ancient Roman temple dedicated to every god is one of the best preserved ancient Roman buildings, and it has the biggest dome in the history of architecture. According to an urban legend, rain cannot fall inside the Pantheon through the circular oculus in the middle of the dome. But that's not true, and there's actually a drainage system below the floor that handles the rain during storms. Today, the Pantheon is also the burial place for many important Italian personalities, from the King Vittorio Emanuele II, the first king of Italy, 
to the painter Raphael. We leave the Pantheon to go back to Piazza della Rotonda, the square where this ancient Roman building is located. Our next destination is another much bigger square of Rome, Piazza Navona, that was built on the site of the ancient Stadium of Domitian and has its same form still today. This wide open space was filled with water and mock naval battles were held here. One of the most famous features of this square is the Fontana dei Quattro Fiumi, the Fountain of the Four Rivers, by Gian Lorenzo Bernini, topped by the ancient Egyptian obelisk of Domitian and dedicated to the power of the Pope and his family. The sculptures at the base of the fountain represent the main rivers of the four continents recognized at the time. The Nile in Africa is represented by a god whose head is covered because at the time the source of the river was unknown, and by a lion drinking water under a palm tree. The Danube in Europe is the most civilized god and is represented by a horse ready to gallop on the Danubian plains. The river Ganges in Asia is symbolized by a god that shows indifference to the light of the church and therefore represents spiritual ignorance. And finally, the Rio de la Plata in America is symbolized by an odd-looking crocodile and by a god who has started to see the light because he is representative of the newly converted lands. But there's more to say about this statue. The, the, the architect that designed this fountain is Bernini. And the architect that designed the church in front of the fountain is Borromini, and they were rivals. So, as you can see, the statue of the man holding his hand uh, uh, in front of his face is to cover his eyes from the ugliness that, you know, the church is. Because Bernini, you know, meant to say that this church looks so awful that I don't even want to see it. I don't know if this is totally true, but it's, you know, people see it. So we go from the majestic Piazza Navona and its numerous street artists to a much smaller but very quaint square called Campo dei Fiori, with lots of little cafes and where a market is held every day. And they're actually cleaning after it right now. In the year 1600, the philosopher Giordano Bruno was burnt alive here for heresy by the Catholic Church, just because he believed that God was inside nature and not outside of this world. His books were of course banned by the Holy Office, but today a monument by Ettore Ferrari dedicated to him stands on the exact spot of his death, facing defiantly the Vatican as a symbol of freedom of thought. But now there's a very important thing that we have to do, and so we head back to Piazza Navona, and from there we need to walk through one of its little side streets to have gelato at one of the best places in Rome, the Frigidarium, where after choosing your favorite flavors, you can have your cup or cone dipped in white or dark chocolate that will form a nice crunchy chocolate shell around your gelato. Have you decided which one? I didn't even see them because there are too many people. <laughs> okay. I want something fruity. Like fruity something like cake. what? Like this. Yeah, there are. Chicho, chicho arancia. What so, is that? Choco arancia. Choco, choco arancia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's that? Too? figure out what chicha was. It's a uh, raspberry. Yes, that's a tough decision, but eventually Tvertko makes his choice. And now it's time to find out if coming here was a good idea or not. Okay. So what, what flavors did you choose? Mint. Yeah. And chocolate and orange. And and white, white chocolate, chocolate on white it. White chocolate oh. on top of it. Oh yeah, wait. Oh. It actually goes together, just so you know. Mm. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. So this was a good oh, yeah. choice, taking oh, yeah. you here mm. at the Fiji Dari. Every day. Every day? You, you're gonna say two days, so. Okay. So, tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. Oh my god, this is amazing. And this white chocolate, it's just amazing. Yeah. I, I just wanna drink it. <laughs> Apparently, not only coming here was a good idea, but it looks like we'll be coming back tomorrow as well. In the meantime, Giuseppe leaves us, and we head towards the Tiber, the river that flows through Rome. 
Inside this building, on one of its banks, we can see the Ara Pacis, an ancient altar dedicated to Pax, the Roman goddess of peace. And here's the Tiber, in Italian Tevere, which is the third longest river in Italy, although its waters here in Rome are not the cleanest. But there are floating restaurants here, and even small floating houses where people live. We keep walking along the Tiber on a tree-lined street, and after a while we get to Via della Conciliazione, from which we can easily reach Castel Sant'Angelo, commissioned by the Roman Emperor Hadrian as a mausoleum for himself and his family. A legend says that the Archangel Michael appeared on top of it with a sword in his hand as a sign of the end of the plague of the year 590. And so we admire this beautiful castle and the bridge of Hadrian, now called Ponte Sant'Angelo, that leads to it. But we especially admire the beautiful sky and its fiery clouds as the sun is setting on this beautiful day.